I'd like to uh, right now like to invite uh, Ken to uh, come and talk to us about ERCP through the uh, endoscopic GI anastomosis route. Thank you. So we've heard about how the LAMS enables an anastomosis with the gallbladder and it allows us to enter into the gallbladder and perform interventions essentially extending the reach of the uh, endoscope. Now we're going to talk about creation of an enteral uh, bypass. So again, the theme here is about creating an anastomosis with the lambs. Historically, uh, if we wanted to do ERCP in patients with altered anatomy, we had to perform enteroscopy, deep enteroscopy. This is as you know, time consuming, it takes a great deal of effort. We have long limbs, a lot of looping, sharp angulations, especially if you're entering into the afferent loop, and there are limitations that are imposed by the enteroscope. There's no elevator, small working channel, and we need enteroscopy length accessories. So time consuming, high failure rates, and there is perforation risk. So we always hated having to do deep enteroscopy. So with EOS-guided enteral bypass, we can take the shortcut. So in the United States, where there are many patients that are post-gastric bypass, we frequently take the shortcut in patients who have had the, uh, a gastro, uh, that have had a bypass and we can perform a gastrogastrostomy or the EDGE procedure. So you can see that shown uh, here, where we're able to enter into the remnant stomach from the pouch. We also have, in patients who have had a RUI hepatical jejunostomy, we can take the shortcut and create a gastroenterostomy. You show that, that's shown here. Patients who have a long afferent limb after Bill Roth II, also a gastroenterostomy shortcut. And patients who have afferent loop syndrome after a, a Whipple, a gastroenterostomy. And then we can perform an enteroenterostomy in patients who are post Whipple, whether it's a classic or with a rule limb. So there are two categories of challenges when performing ERCP through the LAMS bypass. First, LAMS related, and second, ERCP related. So let's start with the LAMS related, and the first is deployment. And as I mentioned earlier, you need to have an adequate runway to safely deploy your distal flange in your target. And as mentioned, we're usually using a 20 millimeter to accommodate our scope. So technically we're looking at a 38 millimeter runway, but I would say you have to have a minimum of 30 millimeters to safely deploy your distal flange. So you will usually need to optimize your target. And one way to do this is to puncture with a 19 gauge FNA needle. You have it hooked up to a syringe already flushed through so that you're not infusing gas. Hook it up then to a pump. And for the edge procedure, you will then fill the remnant stomach with saline so that it becomes a spacious target. Or in this instance, after a Whipple procedure, you can puncture the jejunal limb here and fill it In those patients who have had, um, where you're not able to adequately dilate or distend with 19 gauge saline infusion, you can perform an enteroscopy um, and you can then infuse saline directly into that limb. You have to be quick, obviously, when you exchange out for your echoendoscope. So you need to have a sufficient target and the, and, and if you have that, then at least you can ensure that you can safely place your lambs inside the target. But the greater nemesis is dislodgement of your lambs. And so the key is prevention. And I have these four tips to prevent dislodgement. First, 
identify the optimal site for lambs bypass. Second, choose the largest diameter lambs suited for the anatomy, ideally 20 millimeters. Lubricate the lambs and your scope with oil. You may or may not want to anchor your lambs with suturing or, or an over the scope clip. We don't do that. I don't personally do that, but I make sure that everything is lubricated very well. We use the sweet oil shown here. And you avoid any advancement against resistance. For the edge procedure, it's very critical to identify the optimal site for your lamb's placement. You should target the upper body and the fundus. You're going to run into problems if you target the distal body or the antrum. So this is where on fluoroscopy, you want to have your echoendoscope angled towards the uh, fundus. You do not want it angled down towards the distal body or the antrum. And you can see why, that when you then later pass your duodenoscope or even a forward viewing scope, you then have this sharp angle that you have created because you entered too distal. So this is the way it should look. If you look into retroflexion, this is the incisura here, it really looks no different than the way you would pass a duodenoscope through the mouth, right? So you're looking back towards the fundus. If you see your lambs here in the distal body, then you're likely to have problems. For an enteral bypass, for an enteral enterostomy, you then use EUS to place your uh, lambs as close to the ampulla or the anastomosis as possible. Look for your landmarks, the liver, the portal vein, and the bile ducts. And sometimes I'll even do a transhepatic bile duct injection. You can also add a rendezvous, obviously, to that so that you are as close to the ducts as possible. Now, after an edge, traversing the pylorus can be challenging, especially if you placed your lambs too distal. So then what usually will work is to dilate with a balloon, to dilate the pylorus with the balloon catheter here. So we use the largest balloon catheter, a 20 millimeter. So you can see that in this video here, inflating the balloon. And as soon as you, after you've, inf you've dilated that pylorus, then you can attempt to pass your duodenoscope across the pylorus. But again, never push excessively against resistance. So now you can see how afterwards, with the duodenoscope, we can pass into the bulb and then onwards into the second duodenum. And then here you see the papilla. Trying to advance. There we go. Now the other option is to exchange the duodenoscope for a forward viewing scope, but you must add a cap. So here you can see insertion of the forward viewing scope across the lambs. Here's the pylorus. We're able to cross the pylorus. And now you've got to be, you have a little bit, it's different obviously using a forward viewing scope, but the cap is extremely helpful and I think essential to be able to access the papilla and place a stent, for example, here for drainage. Now, we can salvage a dislodge lambs using a SEMS. Key is that you pass a wire through the lambs. You can see that shown here. Deploy the SEMS through the lambs. So this is SEMS in lambs. Anchor the SEMS, so you really should suture this in. And then you can perform a second step ERCP in two to three weeks. So obviously, this is an instance where you don't want to force your scope through your SEMS, even if you have sutured it in place. What about a failed ERCP after the EDGE procedure? Well, this is where you can 
use the standard approaches that you've heard about earlier today. You can perform a transhepatic rendezvous procedure. So we start with the 19 gauge transhepatic puncture from the pouch. So this is coming from the pouch. This is a dilated intrahepatic duct. And then we pass our guide wire into the duodenum across the ampulla. Then we insert the gastroscope. It's, this is very difficult after an edge procedure using the duodenoscope. So this is where you really need to use the gastroscope with the cap. And you catch the wire with the forceps. You can see that here. Then you retract the wire through your working channel. And now you have a guide rail so that you can pass your instruments directly into the bile duct. So you really don't need the duodenoscope. And for example, here you can stent the bile duct. After um, uh, a failed ERCP, after an enteral bypass, here too you can perform a transhepatic rendezvous procedure. Same, per, same algorithm, 19 gauge transhepatic puncture from the jejunum. So we're coming from the jejunum in this patient status post Whipple. And we uh, advance the wire across the colodoco jejunostomy. We insert the gastroscope to the afferent limb, and we catch the wire with a forceps. Sometimes you are going to need to use your pediatric uh, colonoscope for this. You retract through the working channel, and then you place your bile duct stent, or of course any instruments. If you have a stone, you can pass all of these. It just needs to be enteroscopy length if you're using a pediatric colonoscope. But still, this has significantly shortened the time and the effort to perform ERCP with just enteroscopy alone. And then finally, if the rendezvous fails, that's where you need to be prepared to create a hepaticoenterostomy. So you dilate the transhepatic tract. You can use a bougie, a balloon, or your cystotome. And then you create a hepaticoenterostomy with a covered SEMS. And so you can see in this patient uh, who uh, failed the rendezvous procedure, you can see I have the guide wire in place. I couldn't get across the stricture here. And so I placed in the gastric pouch in this patient who had, uh, uh, had a prior gastric bypass, you can see the expandable, fully covered expandable stent draining the intrahepatic ducts. So in conclusion, there are advantages of the shortcut, taking the shortcut over enteroscopy guided ERCP, saves time, it enables ERCP through side or forward viewing scopes, and you can use your standard ERCP accessories. Location matters. So you need to take the time to identify the optimal site for your lamb's placement. Dislodgement is preventable, and specialized maneuvers may be needed for ERCP. Thank you. OK, so we just have a short discussion because we are a bit uh, over time. Thank you for your excellent talk. Uh, so uh, EDG, uh, very help. Uh, my question is a lot uh, for EDG. Will you prefer wire guided or wireless guided for puncture? Ah, uh, yes. So it's never wrong to preload your electrocautery enhanced delivery catheter with the wire. But you don't really want to advance the wire before you puncture, so don't do the puncture over the wire because you may push your target away. It's less critical, I have to admit, for the edge procedure, right? And that's because usually there is some adherence of the remnant stomach against the pouch. Oh. So, it, it, you know, it's not like the small bowel. All right, a jejuno jejunostomy is completely different. There, you absolutely do not want to try to advance it over the wire. Yes. I think Takao showed that earlier on, performing gastroenterostomies very nicely, that there's a higher risk of pushing the bowel away. Okay. But for the edge procedure, 
It's really uh, not an issue if you want to place a guide wire very early on when I started performing the edge procedure. I passed the guide wire really to see whether I had a straight shot down to the pylorus. So I actually tried to get my wire under fluoroscopy to cross the pylorus because I had encountered situations not realizing how important it is to target the upper stomach and that's really the key. So since I've paid attention to targeting really more like the fundus, you should, on EOS, you should see the spleen. Then you know you're in the right spot. So make sure that you're targeting the upper part of the stomach. If you're too far distal, that's where you're going to run into problems trying to get your endoscope, whether it's a duodenoscope, even the gastroscope, you may have difficulties. Thank you so much. Okay, any question? No. Okay. Can I, uh, short question. So the, how to decide the uh, optimal uh, puncture site? Yes. Hmm. Uh, how do you decide? Well, again, so as I mentioned, uh, for the edge, right, you use fluoroscopy. That's where floral is very important. And uh, you just make sure you're going very high, all right? So that's optimal is high. Mm. Now, for a enteroenterostomy, that's really where you want to be as close mm. to, the, to, the, to the papilla, mm. if the patient has normal anatomy still, or the anastomosis, in hepatico jejunostomy. So what's critical is you're close to that target. Because I, my failures have been when I simply created my bypass, but then I had difficulty advancing my scope to the papilla or the anastomosis. So take the time to identify the landmarks. Liver, obviously, portal vein, intrapatic ducts, and I even sometimes, as I mentioned, will inject with an FNA needle, you can use a 22 gauge, into the intrahepatic ducts, fill in, you can see where the contrast comes out. Mm. Then you know that's where you're going to need to target. Okay, thank yes. you. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, we have to bring this uh, exciting session to a close.